what I feel is lacking and might be our Achilles heel as we go through, through this transition is the ability to nail uh, pathic experience and, and the ability to put people reliably, systematically, do we even want that, through experiences of rapport with the transcendental. In other words, to re-enchant the world, once the gods have left the temples, there's no way they come back. And that's something that Jung said. And I think it's precise because the old gods, again, are dead, as they were in the early Neolithic, right? They, they have no say. And the new gods are emerging, and we're going to take a beating as they emerge because we don't know how to deal with them. We need to invent the rituals. We need to invent the technologies, literally the methodologies to put people, specific people, in a pathic, intransmissible, esoteric relationship with it. Now, many of the mystery schools and ancient traditions and, 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 and so many across the world have this outer body of knowledge which constitutes the mythos and the logos of each age, but they also have this esoteric body of knowledge which is something much more subtle much harder to achieve, something that demands, and this is kind of my, the conclusion that I've been coming to. It demands works of heroes, of people with high spiritual talents, maybe with high artistic talents. Uh, in other words, it feels like it's not obvious that we're going to be able to understand uh, how to navigate that new intense experience of Cynthia's or, or, or whatever that ends yep. up looking like. Uh, I understand. Just like yeah, a little that's, bit that's the liminal. I mean, to me, what you're describing is, is the liminal space in which we find ourselves in. And it's scary as shit. Yeah. Talk to me about, talk to me about as, a, as, a, as a clinical psychologist, about moments when people have these experiences, maybe not only through art and psychedelics, but maybe through the, the, through the challenges of daily life. Sure. Um, well, there's the uplifting ones, and then there's the destructive ones. Uh, so the destructive ones, if you want to go there, I mean, the destructive ones are when you're operating on a system that you hope but fear is, you hope is adequate but fear is not, okay? And then shit starts happening that makes your fear that it's not adequate get more inactivated, but you compensate, you deny, you avoid, you buckle down, you c continue until all of a sudden either, you know, over a series of, you know, events that break the camel's back or a crash that breaks the camel's back, you shatter your just world. Okay. And then you enter into either an existential crisis, a crisis of understanding and meaning making that's like, oh my fucking God, mm -hmm. I can't make, what am I? And what difference does it make? And why the hell am I here? And why did I put all my eggs in this basket and the basket turned out to be all cracked? Mm -hmm. What the hell am I going to do? Okay. So now you're defeated and broken, an unjust world narrative and an ineffectual self and a meaning-making system that feels dead-ended. Okay. Or you do that emotionally, phenomenologically. Okay. In other words, you stop asking, your justification system essentially turns off. You stop asking questions, it shrinks, and the depressed or anxious state of phenomenology gets active. If it's a depression, you shut down and just sleep and, and pull the blinds in and are in an emotional, motivational state of shutdown because there's no, there's no way to get nourishment that you can see that isn't more painful than it is pleasurable. You don't know how to get out of the cage that you're in. Or you're in just an agitated defensive state okay, of chronic generalized anxiety and distress where you're hoping that the next threat doesn't knock you over, but you're already anticipated, so you wait in the corner in a hyper state or some combination of that. Mm -hmm. So the system breaks you down, it breaks you down cognitively, you don't have passive behavioral investment, and you sit in an either depressed, distressed uh, state of negative affect, and you're not a fucking happy camper. <laughs> you know. Is there a relationship between that those being kind of the negative aspects of the negative instantiations of like process of transcendence and like the breaking down of personalities. So you describe the negative. Right. Um, I'm thinking back to, to, to when Muhammad in just a few years managed to rile up so many soldiers to conquer so much land so quickly. I'm thinking back to 
crusaders who, who went on promise to, to faraway lands to fight. I'm thinking of even World War II, what Hitler was managing to inspire the Germans sure. to do as, as kind of a cult-like mechanism. Do you think yep. that that has a relationship with, with this topic and how? Yes. Well, okay. So it, it has a relationship but in which I would say is when people are feeling vulnerable, okay, and, and when they're uncertain, then there's going to be a potential, if it can be charged with a justification, influence, and investment pathway, okay, yes. to be realized and then led. So if somebody gets a justification narrative that then other individuals can channel their investment pathway, and then you create a herd mentality around, all right? In other words, you get enough, remember, we're very, very, we're tracking what other people are doing. We're through it through mimetics. If somebody's moving towards it, I'm moving towards it. Remember the yeah. merge of the herd and your social influence is then tied to that. You get a momentum of a herd with a narrative about what it ought to do. And it was vulnerable and trapped. And now all of a sudden we see a way out. We can be, there's an exodus through and to the other side. Okay. That will, and then if you have depression or anxiety on the backside of that, that's motivating your ass through that, you can channel an enormous amount of energy. In fact, that's exactly what Hitler did. And that, that metaphor, as he was talking about that, oh, and I, I feel like you have a question after this. Um, maybe it's, it's, the, it's the story of having depression or the Pharaoh behind you and in front of you, you're so, the myth is so strong that it even splits the waters, that it even creates new justification investment pathways. And I think what we're witnessing today, obviously, is similar. On our past is kind of a dead, derelict, uh, uh, sense-making system that is kind of in disarray. And Cynthia's is, is the exodus towards Cynthia's is this phylum. That's right. Technological right. in nature. And it's the pathway. I really found that right. word pathway interesting. Yes. And it's a pathway on the, on the one side, you have chaos. On the other side, you have excessive order. And you have to navigate that pathway. The liminal space between order and chaos. If, we do, if there's too much chaos and there's too much chaos from the outside, all of a sudden, boom, the water's going to come washing fucking over you. Yeah. If it's too much rigidity, will he be frozen or frozen by the gods, i.e. turn us into a 1984 hell going forward in a, in a digital world kind of world, okay? So we have to navigate this uh, issue of uh, this dialectic between order and chaos as we move from the known which is failing us behind us into the unknown to try to create uh, the pathway, ultimately, from my mythos, is the pathway to the garden. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the path. You know, everything we've just been talking about, feel so apt for the state of the world right now and even to the day right it's the third of june right now and what the fuck is going on out in the streets of the usa thousands of people burning shit the fuck down so right. you know it's they're pissed and they're angry and they're upset and i have sympathy with that and then there's also it seems to be nefarious agents piggybacking on it to achieve other goals Antifa protesters who seem to be showing up. I saw something today about like Chinese protesters who seem to be, I mean, it, it could all be speculation. Sure. It could all be internet shit, but Chinese people supposedly staying there because the Chinese consular told them to be there. There's clips of the Chinese state media condemning America and it's racism. And it's like, you guys are fucking murdering your own people because they're of an ethnic, diff, different ethnic background. Like it's fucking cynical. Right. And th that's the great tragedy of it. Right. Is like, like what, what it feels to me right now with this, with the, the, the Black Lives Matter people out on the streets is a lot of their lives aren't mattering. They're being used as pawns in a much so, bigger game, much bigger game. That great. anger, it, it's, it's that cult phenomenon again. It, it's yep. people with something to tie them together and a grievance with something that they legitimately want to achieve. But totally. then someone else can, can come along and say, I've got the algorithms, I can hire the people. And it's, it's scary as fuck, man. Well, that's, that's exactly the nightmare that we're facing over here. I mean, the, the, everything, the system has been frayed across so many different thousands of cuts in terms of you need a higher organizational structure that's got an infrastructure, not only a roads infrastructure, but an infrastructure of trust and an ecology of information and a, a legitimacy of hierarchy about what it is that's happening and why things are happening. We've been blowing that up for the last 15, 20 years. Okay, and now, and we, we become so unbelievably polarized that we essentially are in the midst of a nasty divorce, essentially, between Republican men and Democratic 
feminine archetypes and they split and then you've lost all trust and it turns into a game. And now it's in a game and there's no, there's no appreciation for the family and the children anymore. There's simply appreciation for, do I get the custody at the symbolic level and do I win this goddamn thing so that you lose? That's what I care about. So now you get something like this going on and you know, all of the, you know, it's an election year. There's so much chaos. There's so much misdirection. Everyone's trying to shine the light on certain things all out of, you know, motives that are designed for short-term influence and game winning as opposed to long-term consolidation about what our identity and values are. So this opportunity now is just not, it's a manipulative opportunity for the left and the right, you know, to, rather than have it be contained and say, okay, here's the issues. How do we think about this? What is the aggregate issues of race in relation versus what are these incidents? How do we think systematically about the kind of changes that would be useful? No, it's just, here's a shit. Oh God, this means racism. The left goes insane and be like, oh my God, we're the racist thing in history when we're not. I mean, we've been at all these changes, very substantial changes. And I say that as a clinical psychologist, works with a lot of African-Americans. This is a, the world's gotten a lot better at the level of race in our world, in the United States. But some people are, you know, active in a particular kind of way that hold on to that narrative. Then we elect Trump and you have all, right? And now you basically have this very, very, um, polarized, hostile, chaotic system. And that's what my, terrifies me, is that the new system in this chaotic knowledge system, the new information technology like social media, cr isn't reined in. We haven't figured out a way to tame the gods. And as a function of it, they're running in a fucking run wild and cause us all to go crazy and do unbelievably stupid, destructive things like I see happen in the clinical room all the time, only just at a macro level, societal scale. That's what I'm terrified about. I, 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 go ahead, Owen. I was just going to say it's self-harm, right? That's what it is. It's someone takes a wrist, a blade to their wrist and slices it. Someone throws a Molotov cocktail into their local supermarket so their grandma can't go and buy food. Same thing. It's, 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 yeah, it's everybody. It just gets raw and raw, more and more regressive shame and hate. And then and the system is just operating and, you know, and it's spreading. And I'll pick up on something that that you yeah, said, Greg. I think you said "rain in the gods." Was that right? Yeah. Nice. Because I was riffing off your comment earlier. Because the gods are run—you know, things are running wild. Indeed. So it, 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna take a clue off of Nick Land. And Nick Land is a weird guy, but he's so smart in many ways. And one of the things that he says is that, and I'm gonna like butcher the metaphor and make it really simple. It's that gods are also alive and they work like bacteria and they have these bacteriological uh, system relationships between each other. They live off of our brains and they're composed of memes and all that. And my point is that we can and we might domesticate them. And maybe we need to domesticate them. Meaning ontological design coming in. Um, and I think that that's already gonna happen with, with many agents trying to use AI to define cults but I think that the, one of the promises of ontological design might be to be able to overtake the perceptional space of humans and by selecting and an, an effective policing what goes in and goes out, restrain, and, and if, if that is done wisely, domesticate the gods. Yep. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, my uh, one way of thinking about what I'm trying to do from a psychotechnology level is I'm trying to say, hey, here's the basic blueprint of human nature. Okay. Your basic architecture for human nature. Understand whatever de de technology comes, unless we totally change our human nature, which then we wouldn't be human anymore. But to the extent that this primate remains sort of the trunk of the system that we are growing, let's understand what the hell it is. Okay. Uh, and so that we can honor it uh, so we can honor its place in nature as we explore the possibility of figuring out the new practices for the new gods and how to tame them. Yeah, because it, 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 needs, it comes from a series of emergence layers and mm -hmm. they need, it needs to pay attention to that phylum as well. And for the same reason that you don't plant uh, tomatoes in February, because yep. you need to be perceptive about the right time and place for certain things. And I guess that's 
why someone once said millionaires don't believe in astrology, but billionaires do. And the way that I understand this <laughs> sentence is that astrology uh, here is used to signify a clock on which to measure the humors and the dynamics of the human souls collectively. Yep. And, and so, so for me, what I do in relationship to this, this sense making, so I use the tree of knowledge. Uh, the inside the tree of knowledge creates the edge of my empirical world. Okay. So it's my natural scientific uh, sense making system from physics, uh, biology, science of psychology, science, social sciences. Now this is a lens for me to understand the real empirical world. Okay. And it's a skeptical lens, but then there's an edge around that, the agnostic edge. And then the agnostic edge says what the fuck's on the outside of that. Okay. And then you stand from a particular place of, of grounding and then wonder about what it is that's on the other side of that edge. Okay. And there are a number of things that make me have a mystical open attitude to what's floating on the atmosphere around the edge of this basic scientific understanding. All right. The things that's super interesting that I use from a magical perspective, I emphasize this on the listserv, is the singularity. Okay. So there, there is an emergence of an accelerating wave of complexity that can be mathematized. That's been mathematized by Koyarov, who's that's a Russian name. All right. It, unbelievable. His, his view of, of big history, and he doesn't know what it means, um, but he did a really fascinating mathematical analysis of identified complex developments in, in technology into the history uh, of major developments all the way back to the Big Bang that were organized by um, United people in the West, so Western, and then done the same basic thing in Russia, but with totally different data points because they had a slightly different emphasis. So did you, you know, was DNA on, I mean, discovery of DNA versus some of the major elements that Russian science developed, blah, blah, blah. So they tracked this shit. <clears throat> and then the, the basic curve of acceleration goes up, gets to an accelerating point where it reaches its limit in 2027 on the Western and 2029 on the Russian layer, okay? And that's an unbelievably bizarre coincidence. I'll put it that way. Just unbelievably bizarre coincidence. And the regression line is 0.994, I think, on the Western and 0.996 on the Eastern. I mean, we're not talking about like, oh, this was a hard line to fit. We're talking about a line that fits almost fucking perfectly. Okay. Why, the, what the hell this line means and what exactly it crosses is a really interesting point. But what does it give us? My whole point is, that the, it, I'll, I'll add this too. So Graham Snooks is the guy that actually coined the term uh, singularity. And he hates, he hates anything that sort of turns the singularity into something uh, magical. And he calls it metaphysical historicity. Okay, this idea of any, any time that there's a crossover. Metaphysical historicity. All right. Now, why I love that term. In fact, I'm going to have a conversation with Grant Fuchs. Now, he's a skeptic at, at, at any level of meeting, okay? But let's come back to this in relationship to the gods. If we're in the process where we can locate ourselves and develop a descriptive metaphysical system that looks out at the future and creates a magical idea about what could be that tracks a particular kind of empirical line, you see where I'm going with this? You create an image of the future a faith-based image of the future that intersects a wide variety of different knowledge systems in a really bizarre way, okay? You are intersecting a magical kind of potential system. You're intersecting an old final causation notion about what deism might be. You're intersecting all sorts of different notions, okay? And if you create a techno-social singularity where the internet wakes up and each of us has a basic understanding of this complex adaptive observer that's observing the complex adaptive process of the emergence of this particular entity, and we collectively emerge it individually and together, man, you get a, you get a fascinating fucking intersection. And uh, the kind of inter religious intersections. Religious. Religious intersections. That kind of shit for the 20, that's the kind of shit that can move people and move them in the right direction. That's basically tracking the phylum of the likeness of God. Like you see, tracing the image of God through history is metaphysical historicity. That's beautiful. 
How do we solve sex and conflict then? <laughs> I need to come back to sex and conflict. It's supposed to be chaotic. You know, obviously Freud, you know, Freud's gonna loom large. Sex and aggression and conflict, obviously, you know, that's what you know. <laughs> you don't fucking solve sex and <laughs> unless you get laid. <laughs> then the short term. You're so uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, listen, first off, I, you know, any any discussion of game B, for example, if you want to go to sort of that type, because of the rivalrous language, I'll use that. Okay. That we do not want, we don't want full fledged cooperation without mutual competition. I mean, we want mutual competition embedded in our cooperative systems. You never want to let go of mutual com competition if you understand the architecture, of, in my estimation, of our primate architecture, okay? And the I, if we try to get rid of meritocratous competition and differential access, say, to sexual um, you know, exploits and connections and commitments, we, we try to flatline that. Yeah, well, well, you're walking right into communism. You know, authoritarian communism. The only way to hold that down uh, is through a communist and totalitarian. Unless we're talking about such a different design world, uh, that's and indeed the robotic virtual world. God only knows. Obviously, all of that is changing in a particular kind of way, right? Uh, you know, certainly. What a, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, uh, the, uh, just sorry for the interruption. It's no. precisely in the in the emergence of the of this religious idea at the edge of the metaphysical history and at the edge of technology, it's precisely at that point where the addition of sex and conflict makes it all really confusing and potentially scary. Because if only, if, if it was, if we exclude these wild dimensions of sex and conflict, which they are wild and chaotic, then we, then indeed this story would be one of moving towards a heavenly right. Jerusalem, right? It's, it's moving towards a moment where the collective hive mind becomes sentient and something else happens. But then there's always that, that level of that makes everything unpredictable, wild. Omo omini lupus. Man is man's wolf. And that's a weird one. Well, it's it's a always it's the emerging problem, always the emerging problem. That actually any, in my estimation, at least, this is, you know, there are principles and processes, but this thing, the pathos, the ideographic, the dark, the crazy, the different, all of that shit is going to play itself out. It's going to be. It is part of. It's part of the reality. Mm -hmm. You can't legislate it out. You can't extract it out. You can only create dialectical systems between pathos, mythos, and logos that dialectically orient toward an ethos in all its messiness. That's, that's, that's a, very good, a very good pointer. So really articulating almost the dialectics that will happen within this broad system that we're able to envision. Is that right? Absolutely. That you have to, that's, that's, it's the frame that the thing grows around. But its messiness is always, that's always going to be the unprestatable emergence. You try to create a system that can account for all of that, you're dead in the water as far as something. Could you give me an example of how, of how that, that wilderness sure. is used as an engine within a frame? Right. So, like, uh, I'll give you an example because I use this in terms of my psychotherapeutic work all the time, which is appropriate for the pathos. Okay. So there's a thing I developed called COMMO. You may have seen it talk about on the listserv. All right. So IMO is a set of interlocking principles and processes all right, that help create logos and mythos to regulate your pathos. Okay. And they, so what, is it, what does it say? Essentially, it's a way for us as a group and a way to internalize a wise elder view so that you can then regulate yourself, but it doesn't, okay, it doesn't turn you into a script of wherever the, it allows your pathos to go where it's going to go, but it holds it in a particular way. Hmm. All right. So it's an integrative approach to psychological mindfulness that says, hey, psychological mindfulness, become reflective about where you are, develop a metacognitive stance, recognize that you step outside the stream of your awareness so that it becomes the object of your awareness, okay? and then gets practice doing that, either inside your head or actually as you talk to people. Then it says, hey, what do you actually do with that? You then cultivate an attitude of calm, okay? So if your pathos is going crazy with your sex and aggression, right? First thing you wanna do is reference at least in calm. 
That's not to control it, but just to create a dialectical reference in relation. Mm -hmm. And then if, this, if the pathos is spilling out all over shit in a way that's creating dysfunctional cycles, then you bring the calm close and you start to say, the first thing you do is you get curious. Why? What is this energy? Why the fuck is it spilling out all over everywhere? Where does it come from based on your tra tragic past? What is it trying to tell you? How do other people relate to it? Okay. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a wise elder, a notion that gets curious so that I understand what all this energy is. The second thing that the ide identity is, is an acceptance. It's going to say, it's going to spill. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to jizz all over the place, you know, in bad ways, potentially. Sorry, but you know, there it is. Okay. It's pathos we're talking here. And I'm a clinician. I deal with this shit all the time. Right. Okay. And then how do, how, how do you build the being acceptance? Well, all the Eastern traditions. I mean, you know, somebody told me I did 15 years of Zen meditation to learn how to fucking accept being. <laughs> That's it. It's like, well, okay. <laughs> you know, and it's not easy, you know. Um, but it is the capacity to sit, you know, without, without attachment to desire and without resistance, okay, and be, right, and recognize that things are as they are in the moment that they are, and, and how to tolerate distress. Mm. Right that. That's what acceptance is. Right? Mm -hmm. And in Western psychotechnologies, it's distress tolerance. It's recognizing shit. You don't know what's going to happen. You are going to die. You're going to, how do you manage that? Okay. <laughs> and then L stands for loving compassion. It's an attitude that basically says, hey, you have dignity. You, I confer respect to you. I confer respect to the people around me. And compassion is I don't want destructive suffering to befall you or me. Okay, I'm going to hold you. I'm not going to moralize you. I'm not going to shoot you to death. I'm simply going to hold you as a being that's worthy of respect. I'm going to hope for you not to suffer, and I'm going to hope for you to flourish, which then gives into M. M stands for motivated toward valued states of being in the short and long term. If your pathos is spilling out all over everywhere, how are you going to clean it up in the short term? Yeah. What's good for you in the, in the, after this hour? What's good for you after the day? plan out what it is. How do you become what you want to be as you are being what you are? Very cool. You do that across the short term. And then how do you do that across your lifespan? Ultimately, what are called you mm -hmm. values, which are what do we want somebody to say in the arc of history that looks back at your life and says how you lived it? Mm. Do you know what? This feels like we're getting close to territory now where I think a person who did great work was one Mr. Jordan Peterson who showed up ah. in culture. <laughs> And really spoke, I think, to, to men and young men in particular who are feeling lost and confused and pissed Absolutely. off. Who, from our understanding of, of sexuality, it's young men who get dangerous when their pathos spills over. Women have a tendency, they also have pathos, but it seems to be less outwardly directed. Right? It's men mm -hmm. who get pissed off and tear shit down and beat each other up, beat their friends up kill themselves much more frequently. There's something, you probably know the stats better than I do, right? It's like women contemplate or attempt suicide more than men, but men are much better at actually doing it. It's like we'll fucking throw correct. ourselves off the building. And this is where like, I found getting involved with, with actually men's work and the men's work movement in the last year has been super interesting because it, it seems to be, it's this like, when people hear men's work, they sometimes think of like, manosphere or some of the shitty stuff of like guys getting pissed off and wanting to complain about how their lives are, are shit because women don't look at them or don't talk to them that's not what it is it's actually the total opposite of that it's guys getting together and being like right how can we support each other and hold a space for each other as men so that we can show up for the other people in our lives we can show up for women in our lives but then also not be dependent on having a woman in order to feel valued or feel validated or feel a sense of belonging and that we can go in. I mean, so I run a men's circle and every week we turn up and just talk about like, this has been a shit week. I was pissed off. I was upset. I was in another men's circle yesterday and we were doing work on what are difficult emotions that we experience that we find hard to express and how can we practice expressing them here between us precisely so that we can get better at feeling them and embodying them and not exploding them outwards in our lives out there. And this feels 
it's like you're talking about the calm mo is a brilliant psycho technology for working at the personal level i think it's spaces like these like these men's circles and there's hundreds of different things like this but but providing a kind of interpersonal space for exploring and processing pathic energy which is so absent in blue church mainstream culture a hundred percent and, and in fact remember uh, the i said it, it's really about internalizing a wise elder but that's because we're so fucking individualistic if we could actually have wise elders that would be helpful <laughs> right in other words where the fuck are the churches right where we actually do that so that's the whole point is like how do we cultivate individuals that know how to do this for our men and Jordan Peterson got so unbelievably popular because he, he did something that, um, you know, so much of the, the mental health system got feminized, okay? They got unbelievably feminized. Uh, and, and, you know, 90% I, I, of the people I work with are women as a doctor, psychological doctor, okay? Uh, and 85% of the people that graduate. Uh, in the clinical counseling school psychology fields, almost, uh, uh, certainly school and counseling. There's a femininity, which is beautiful and, 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 and remarkable, but it's an archetype that's quite different, you know. And, and if you're operating in a particular kind of space, so with Jordan Peterson comes around, where the feminine is more around, well, how do we create relational connection? How do we understand the impact of how, how am I a particular way that might influence your rights? And how do we do it in a way that you, networks us together because I'm relationally, my perspectual field is more relationally interconnected. Just ask me and my wife. My wife instantaneously comes into a field and says, well, what are my actions doing relative to somebody else? I come in and I'm like, what instrumental problems do I need to solve? And I hope it doesn't hurt anybody else, <laughs> okay? And it's a totally different figure ground relation. And it took us our merit, you know, a couple of sessions in therapy back in the you know, 20s or whatever. And it's like, oh, you see the world this way. And oh, I see the world this way. And now that helps. Now we can talk, right? So what Peterson does is he's like, listen, you know, one of the things, yeah, hold yourself accountable. Move the fucking rock, right? Move the rock. And, and do, it's better to move it forward because there is a fundamental difference on earth between heaven, a happy family system where people are known and valued, they have potential, and the train to Auschwitz, which is hell, right? It is hell on earth, you know? And, and if we're moving the rocks forward, we are moving the system on earth towards heaven. And if we don't, we turn it into our own private hells or we become hellish, especially men, men, and then take on aggression out on other people and bring our hell to other people and create a spread of hell, you know, which is absolutely disastrous. And we have to be responsible so that hell doesn't spread from us. As you were describing the calm and mo, what I was thinking and what I was hearing, because it's so much of that internalization of the wise elder reminds me of the MO that religions have taken throughout the ages and throughout their all of their reforms and many different traditions. It's really about curating your superego, basically. Um, That's right. That's right. And, and, and in a healthy way. The question is how. And in fact, there's a, there's the the antithesis, which I didn't talk about, is what's called critic, which is being okay, which is being critical and judging, resistant, irritable, tense, insistent, okay, and closed. So, so, so our superego, our superego needs to be healthy. To the extent it's healthy, we'll align our ego and our id. To the extent that it's a vicious internalized abuser, and then we're in deep trouble. And then the question is, how do we align to the good? If, to go to Owen's point earlier, which is sort of like, well, just don't get hurt and don't, it doesn't have a vision. The superego needs a vision of aspiring to move toward. One of the things I think that ontological design is, is, is probably going to be able to allow in the future is uh, for us to create a systematics of these practices. And, and maybe the dichotomy between the calm and the critic is something that some of us who maybe are more artistically uh, inclined or, or mm -hmm. in the words of of bard shamanic shamanically mm -hmm. inclined or mystically inclined uh these types of people have an ability to transit between states of being based on yes. the manipulation of their of their perception right as right. you listen to a certain song you put yourself in a specific state and all of a sudden you are a different person right uh, we can do that or it can be done to us or go the critic and the calm uh, based on our internal structures 
And it feels to me like perhaps a pathway towards the resolution of this as we move towards that um, historical moment of the emergence of Cynthia's, which is quite inevitable and it could be hell, it could be heaven, who knows? One essential step on that road could be the systematization of, of these systems just calm and mo, right? Making them yep. not rely on people and the psychotechnology of words, which is something very much of sedentary civilization. And maybe rely on a systematics that is more yes. adapted to the technologies of our, of our day to day. Um, Absolutely, brilliant. That's exactly right. In fact, that whatever that calling was, okay, that transition actually happened to me, which is why I used to do words all the time. And then I turned my theory into a cartoon picture of a garden. I mean, what the fuck? That's insane, right? I was like, what is that? Yeah, and, uh, yeah people are like, well, who are you? Greg, you're a full professor. You're generating a cartoon picture. I'm like, and it's appalling. You know, what am I doing? It's like, it's actually what was, it was a, it was a religious artistic experiential calling. There was some, there was some need. There's also an intuition about what kinds of knowledge systems are going to, the future are going to be, you know? And so it was all of that. And, and, you know, and what I, one, one area that I'm very, I'm not well developed at all in that is so unbelievably important is music. In fact, somebody just reached out to me from Australia who's, who's running a mind uh, in Australia, sort of like some sort of mental health thing in Australia through music. Okay. And, and, and your point, Daniel, that this art and music, this is, uh, Ian McGilchrist makes this point very, very well in the, in the, the Western traditions and its focus on the logos and the word, okay, as a dominator off of the phenomenological intuitive self, which is, you know, intuitively, yes, we can, there is more right hemisphere versus left hemisphere dialectics here. And then the question, yeah. is, can we reveal that? This actually goes back to the um, conversation about transcendence, okay? Yeah. Transcendence fundamentally is getting the left hemisphere logos often out of the way, okay, and 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 allowing the phenomenological sense of the self in relationship to the world, you know, to be transformed in an intuitive, pictorial, affective, vision logic way, that then that then goes right into the body, goes right into relationships, goes right into our primate not nature of being, and and and. Precisely, it's, it's deep, all-encompassing, full spectrum. And one of the things that I usually like to think about that is kind of a, a helpful thing for me in order to be able to conceptualize this whole thing is to posit what are the alternatives to the hegemonic ontological systems that we've been brought up, brought up with. You've mentioned the Western logoic one, uh, mm -hmm. democracy, human rights, even if you have to spread them with bombs. Um, the Cartesian individual, right? And this only dawned on me when I looked at a guy, which is Dugan, which is the weirdest guy ever as an agent, but, but he postulates this for his own gains geopolitical, but he postulates <clears throat> a rival ontological frame at the geopolitical level. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, you mentioned transcendence and these moments where the logos is bursts and the veil of reality opens up um, and that we in the West have a tendency for logo dominant logocentrism and, and that being the dominant frame of mind the exceptions though being the irrationality of rock and roll mm. how it has taken so much from other moments that came just previously uh, immediately mm. before rock and roll where the western mind got a little bit crazy uh, namely mm. world war ii especially the prophetic the the sort of occult uh, transcendental fucking experiment that, that Hitler ran. Right. And my point being that we're going to get, we're going to get to a point, right? Where logocentrism is going to shake. It's going to be shaken by, by the emergence of, of technology. We're going to be forced into pathic experience, whether we like it or not, it's going to be fucked because most people are not going to be able to digest it. Who knows if we are, um, any thoughts on, 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 on that dire, grim sort of forecast? Well, I mean, I, listen, I think that it, the, I find myself looking out at the landscape of possible futures and running, my heart runs the gamut of uh, reaction. And what I mean by that is I think when I'm in my, my negative affect system looks out at the future and is like, oh my God. Okay, like 
yeah, we're maybe all coming down. And certainly, if you're not in high water, you're in deep, deep trouble. Okay, I feel in pretty high water, and I'll feel anxious for me, and I'll feel anxious for my kids, and I'll feel anxious for the chaos around us. All right. So yeah, I mean, it's just too much, too many, too much inertia, too much change that needs to happen, too many things that need to be solved, and and then too much stacked uh, interdependent fragility. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know okay, the pandemic, and then there's the depression, and then there's all these weapons, and then, you know, and then there's, there's no identity, and then everything gets more and more chaotic. You know, we're already worried about the pandemic, now we get a racist riots, and we get this, and we get that, and, uh, you know, we got Trump trying to make decisions. It's just, you know, you just see the chaos, okay? And then I, I certainly feel, feel that. You know, I feel, I, I wait, I've had moments waking up at two o'clock at night feeling it, you know, significantly. Um, it's also the case, you know, I, I read, you know, I've read Steve Pinker's Enlightenment now. I read all sorts of different kinds of, you know, I do carry the idea of an optimistic hope, you know, of, of what it is that actually is potential. I'm having more interesting conversations in the last, you know, three months than I've had, you know, and, and with new people in two years. There's this networks that are starting to form. There are people that are looking. And man, I mean, I can kind of connect with John Verbeke and be like, oh my God, I didn't know John Verbeke in, in August, you know, of, of last year. And, and he's on this path of a meaning-making crisis and a yeah. vision for integrative cognitive science that connects right to mind. So this system is giving rise to an all sorts of different forces, some of which are chaotic, some of which are nasty authoritarian, some of which are beautiful, and some of which are of enormous amount of potential, Okay. So all I can say is what my heart, I don't know. I think anybody that would claim to know what's going to happen is a fool. I mean, by definition, right? We are on the edge of an, by definition, we're on the edge of an unbelievably chaotic and unpredictable time and space. So always that's the case. And this is just multiplied time, whatever. So what I feel is the following. There's a lot of variability. We are at a Kairos moment. There's a lot of different choices that we can make. And that is what calls God or the wise elder or whatever it is that the ultimate good so when I start to feel myself wobble in weakness and in irritability and pettiness, I comment on myself and I feel like this is the time, this is a very important time for being in the right state of mind and on the right side of history. Because we need as many people right now to create a critical mass to move us toward the potential heaven that is the future. Because man, do we got a wide outcome of possibility. There are a lot of hell out there. So that's, that's just what I do to organize myself uh, if I start to feel overwhelmed and then try to recenter re and be part of what it is that would move toward the head. Is it a time for individuals or for groups or for collectives or for man and machine? Or for is, there a time, the above? is it a time frame or did you say, I'm sorry, I missed one. Of your is, is it a time for individuals, for, for groups, for collectives? All for of the above. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it is this. It's a, it's a time to zoom into the future. <laughs> via Zoom. Uh, via Zoom, right? We're zooming, you know, it's zooming is happening, you know, and look, you know, we're all in different, you know, we're across the con Look, we've collapsed space time. Look what digital is, you know, we've completely collapsed space time into this intersection. So that's fascinating, fascinating, right? It's like people keep saying to me, would you go into a university and do a PhD? And I'm saying, like, right now, it actually feels like I'm kind of doing that via the internet. Right. And, and it's available. So we can, there is, I mentioned the wisdom of the ages. And in some ways I was, uh, you know, I, somebody should have slapped me upside the head in some ways because the availability of wisdom. I got, you know, I download a course, like what's meaning in life. This wonderful professor for $20 takes me through for 36 hours. I learned, I learned about Buddhism and Confucianism. And it's just, it's unbelievable. What is fundamentally missing then is somehow an attitude that cultivates these kinds of relationships that brings us together in the, in the social activity of the church and the practices of what the church would give us. So we feel belonging, we feel known and valued, we feel engaged in a participatory act of cultivating the move toward the heaven together. And it's, it's figuring out how to get those practices in our day-to-day -day lives, it's figuring out how to get them in our children so when we educate them, and it's figuring out how to create the, the ethos and the day-to-day -day activities that weave us together as human beings that way and in those in that spirit that's that's what is frayed and if we can weave that stuff back together uh, then at, at that will create a socio-emotional foundation 
And if we, com if we teach common ML and get psychotechnologies and ecology of practices that bring people together, we can, and then people I think will flock to that if, it, if, it, if it's accessible. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, it's so important because I, I can even feel within myself, it's so easy and tempting to lapse into a kind of defeatist mindset of just like, wow, shit is fuck. Just buckle up, hold on to whatever I can and ride it out and try not to get caught up in the storm. Yeah. And it feels like there are, there are some really powerful thinkers and minds who, who are worth learning from. Like I think like the accelerationist guys, Nick Lamb, but then their general conclusions are pretty pessimistic. It's like, there is a machine that's riding us and the machine is going to tear us apart and our ability to pull ourselves together throughout it is, is minimal. There's, there's almost a tendency as well to, to, to cynically view the human attempts to stitch ourselves together with things like ethics and morality as, as just power plays that are basically just in the interests of the strong and that really the people who are playing the game and who are going to win are just the Machiavellians who can paint enough of a nice picture to get people on board because they're saying, yeah, we got the ethics, we got the morality over here. Yeah. I don't subscribe to that framework, but I can feel the pull towards it within me. Right. Well, well any, you know, anybody that reads Foucault or, or any of the postmodern, you know, the intelligent pre postmodern people know that any call to righteousness has got a grammar of power underneath it. And whether it, whatever true good and beautiful people claim, it's got a very dangerous power, manipulative influence dynamic. Okay, so anyone should listen to that. So then the question is, well, how would you then factor out what is the underlying, you always then need to look at, well, what is the underlying influence, power, grammar, control dynamic that's operative? Okay, and then, so then you ask that question. At least me, to the extent that I'm offering a particular kind of grammar, I'm a, I'm a clinical psychologist who, before I built the Unified Theory, I, I'm just an unbelievable individualist. I hate authoritarian shit. I hated school. <laughs> I didn't want anybody to tell me. And I don't want to control anybody. I have no interest in controlling anybody, you know? And I think John Bakey and other people are saying, way. so it's a, there are a lot. Of, so the question is, how do we find leaders who appreciate the communal and the autonomous that offer growth-based visions that are not dominant visions? That's the issue. So if Wilbur makes this very nice distinction between how do we move together with growth hierarchies? And how do we distinguish them from dominant uh, oppressive hierarchies? And there is a way to distinguish those things. Those things are not the same. And there are you know ways what's to come hierarchies. into mind for me now, like something that we said very near the start about our case of if I'm hanging out with your woman out on the plains and then mm -hmm. you come over and you're like, hey man, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, you know, we were just hanging out. Mm -hmm. My ability to actually say, we were just hanging out, even if what I was trying to do in that moment was trying to hook up with her. If I can say, oh, we're just hanging out, and then I begin to craft my, my reality around that statement, oh, we're just hanging out, and I go, do you know what? Maybe it's not the best idea to hook up with Greg's chick. Like, actually, I quite like Greg, and I don't want to destabilize everything. Right. And so there's this, the ability to exist, to, to, to situate oneself within a just, a, a positively oriented justification systems framework means that even when those pathic moments arise, that will to destroy or to fuck another man's woman or man for that matter, mm -hmm. of course we can, we can, we can see them, but redirect that. And that yep. feels like the power of a, of a functioning ethical framework. Right. Well, it's actually, so uh, the, when we get into ethics, so they're, they're basically, from my vantage point, I mean, they're really three major ones. Uh, there's utilitarian ethics, uh, and, and there's deontological Kantian ethics, and there's virtue ethics from uh, Aristotle. I'm sure there are others. I'm not an ethical specialist. Um, but the tension between uh, Kantian deontological ethics is the idea that your self-consciousness system has to commit, and it's going to be in conflict with your fundamental, with your primate and, and, and impulsive, self-centered, uh, pathological drives. So it's a conflict model, which is a lot of validity. There's a lot of truth to that. But the virtue ethics is exactly what you just described, Owen. The Aristotelian virtue ethics is actually how do we cultivate people in so that their identity, their heart, and their relational world is habitually and structurally oriented to do the good. So that, so that you come back and you actually then say, wait a minute, something about my heart decided when I came back and was that way, and I do believe that there is a core, because of our desire for sort of true self known and valued, 
we can actually come back and say, actually, I was a part of something better and bigger than myself. And I think our phenomenology, not just our logos, wants that. So if you can cultivate that, in fact, this is one of the big horrors of modernity is that it was hyper-individualistic. The Cartesian individual is hyper-individualistic. Capitalism is hyper-consumeristic. It doesn't realize that there's actually a love, there's a fundamental desire to be part of the good and actually at a core phenomenological level. So we can cultivate that and say, and say yeah, actually, I wanted to do that as a, as a really internalized, you know, self affirm morality at the level of head, heart, and the other. Well, that's a, that's a virtue ethics that's passed a lot more, uh, that creates a lot more paths to heaven, you know. Uh, so. mm. Daniel, what do you think about this? Because I know you and I sometimes clash a bit on ethics. Yeah, who's good? Um, it's hard to go here. I think this is a technological problem. Um, we know that intersectionalism and postmodernism did throw many of these conceptions of ethics <clears throat> uh, and, and kind of question them in many ways. Um, we can we can see that on the, on the riots that are happening today. Indeed, sense making is further fragmenting as technology and the market develop, and it feels harder and harder to pull people together only by sheer willpower towards a common sense of ethics, which will then function like a primeval contract between people towards the good and, and, and social cohesion and being able not to you know, destroy other people's property and, and their relations and all that. <clears throat> so, so to me, uh, and I'm biased, I, 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 I always give the same answer in a way, but it feels like it's a very, it's a, it's a, very, it's a technological problem that we might be able to solve if we, if we parametrize it and define the parameters sufficiently because uh, uh, we know that the forces of capital and technology are moving very fast and they're essentially breaking apart. So many of the understructures with which we uh, used to rely on in order to build uh, our ethics and our moralities. Um, and then there's also the, the, the valid intersectional question, which is whose values and whose moralities and who builds it. Um, we, we, we are seeing the rights and, and a lot of the movements, the social movements of protest today question exactly that. Um, so, no, yeah, I guess that, that's the mm -hmm. best way that I could put it. Right, right. I mean, the issue of pluralism and, and relativism and whose and the technology, I mean, these are all you know, profound and, and complicated, uh, you know, questions that are part of the messiness of if, if certainly any living messiness. Um, you know, I, I do believe that actually there is a very clear grounding uh, of a moral, relational, universalist position. And what I mean by that is there are, you ask, okay, what are the, the people, anybody of goodwill, you ask, what are you actually trying to do? Okay. What, what, do you, what good do you want? Well, I, I want to protect my own interests and I do care about other people and I hope they go to okay. okay. Uh, you know, I, you want to start at a very common sense, fifth grade level. People will be, I, want to, I don't want to get hurt. I want what's good for me. I want my freedom and I, I hope the best for you. Okay. This will be, there will be a universalism in relationship to these kinds of systems of justification. And, 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 and what you end up with, of course, the, from a postmodern perspective, when you idealize that and you abstract it, and then you place it in particular context, what you see is that it gets corrupted and, and manipulated in particular ways and becomes part of the power grammar, okay? That's a wonderful and crucial critique that I believe that actually if you have access to systems of justification and the way influence and investment dynamics actually work, Okay. You now have an objective way, what the postmodernists didn't have, is they didn't have a theory of human psychology and behavior grounded that's coherent, grounded in science that allows us to describe and explain human behavior this way. That's what the unified theory does. Okay. So unified theory provides a scientific descriptive explanatory framework for humans doing this. And that contextualizes the argument in a different kind of way than most of the postmodernists. It, it validates the vast majority of their observations. But then it sidesteps the issue and anchors it from a different vantage point. Yep. And then all of a sudden, it's sort of like, well, maybe you got a different ground of, of justification upon which to stand that they 
we're essentially arguing you didn't, and I argue, yeah, actually you do. That's a meta modern, basically it's a meta modern sensibility. Yeah, what I what I what I what I do agree with uh, with what you what you just said was that how the justification systems do offer an updated grammar with which to read power relations out there. Uh, reason being that perhaps we could analyze them at the more atomic level. So maybe, um, maybe it's a, it's a matter of, of the wording that we choose. But maybe the power relations that we instantiate, wherein we instantiate our ethics, uh, should be thought of as atomic operational uh, Mimetic apparatuses to mediate interpersonal relationship at the level of every tiny interaction, uh, as opposed to the great overarching law of of the universal God, because obviously universalism has scratches many people the wrong way. However, what, when I had said previously that I felt it had a technical technical aspect to it, this problem, I think it goes straight to the point that you made with. It's a matter of how to technically instantiate justification systems theory and make them oper operational or operative within the context of every human interaction in a user-friendly uh, way that people are able to technologically manage the same way that we can use grammar to do it. Yep, that's actually what the coin is about. It's about it. Yeah. Right, and yeah. then uh, placing it, and even giving yourself the unique ideographic experience of of your human soul spirit in a yeah. definable way. So then there is the inside the system allows enormous amount of ideographic and non. So that yeah, universalism, an authoritarian universalism that's absolutist is absolutely not where I am. Uh, but there are universal relational principles again, sort of like Com Mo set the stage, but also hold. Yeah very, very free, ideographic, unique space you know, across the socio-ecological layering, down in, right into this conversation. Final curveball. <laughs> uh, I feel that, <laughs> and I don't know, this is, this is fun. So the design brief, imagine you have, imagine you have a, a trillion dollars and you can pick the best people in the world to work with you on this. Uh, the best, uh, the best of the best. And imagine that you can put them in contact with the best sort of uh, psychological literature, justification systems, expertise, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's say that they're as, as best informed as one can imagine. Do you think that's enough? Or do you think that it requires the talent of a spiritually literary, literate person to go through a pathic experience that can then be Art, uh, translated artistically by this team of creators. Yeah, no, I, okay, so, I mean, my, what I would then say is I'd actually, then, you know, team up sort of with Zach Stein's notion around education development and think about the children, if we have enough time, okay, so I, uh, the, I want to, I want individuals, the, the, there's a guide rail that creates a development, it creates a developmental intergenerational process, okay, that, that's not static, Okay, the can't be, there's, there is no, this is a 21st century idea, not a 22nd century idea or whatever. And what I mean by that is, is that um, I'm very interested in creating dialectical, dialogos, parameters, okay, that, that, that highlight particular kinds of, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis kinds of notions, all right? At least this is my, and so what my, my response is I'd be careful about saying, okay, yeah, we're going to deliver, we'll put all these people together, have the money, and then we'll produce something. All right. It's, it's producing a pathway. It's not mm. producing the thing. It's producing the pathway that starts you down the thing that then creates an opportunity that plants like in the, at the base of this thing are seeds. It's seeds that then grow into the next tree, the generations that can grow into the next tree. So it has to have that dynamic, autopoetic, um, contextual, historical, you know, places that I'm, I'm very, very sensitive to those kinds of contextual issues. And I, I think, or else it's going to be off. The danger of authoritarianism is at my core. I hate authoritarianism and, and pre-specified, you know, fixed recipe realities about what is the ultimate truth. Oh my of course. God.
it's, it's process. That's a, that's a very good point. Well, we've been going about two hours, guys. Yep, I'm, so definitely I've got something else coming up, so I'm going to need to bolt here in a little bit. Um, but uh, that was a fast two hours, guys. Tell me about it. Covered Thanks, some. <laughs> yeah, fucking great talking to you, man. So covered some vast ground today, Greg. You gave me a lot to think about, especially as as when it comes to to the instantiation of religious experiences into usable products or processes, yeah. as you just finished saying. Well, I mean, you know, this is, uh, listen, the ecology of practices, you know, the religion for the 21st century, the ontological design question. I mean, listen, folks, this is the frame. And, and we got to find, there's a lot of angst out there and a lot of confusion. The issue is how do we channel it, you know, and through the gap, right? Uh, from between order and chaos. And Jordan Peterson starts that thing that is fundamentally, but, you know, he's got to, so he clears some territory, but it is fundamentally, you know, a path that we need to start. And this kind of, these are the kinds of conversations. We need to figure out how to find people who are experiencing the existential angst that are drifting into helplessness, hopelessness, overwhelmed, and then yoke them together and basically be like, no, actually, there's a sense-making path and a way to design our technologies to align ourselves, our world, each other, our natures, and the future potential, and do so that moves us towards heaven on earth. Beautiful. On that. Beautiful. I meant to that. Thank you so much, Greg. All right. All right, guys. Really Good enjoyed it, Greg. All right, take care. That was a good finish. <laughs>